Hi, good afternoon. Uh, today, I had the pleasure to introduce you, Professor Dr. Anemiek Asmarus. Most of you already know her. Uh, she's a professor of translational genetics at the Department of Human Genetics of the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. She played an important role in the development of antisense mediated exon skipping for Duchenne muscular dystrophy during her PhD research at the uh, Leiden. She's a PI since 2007, and since 2013, she was a visiting professor at the John Walton Muscular Dystrophy Research Center at Newcastle University. In 2020, she co-founded the Dutch Center for RNA Therapeutics, a non-profit academic collaboration aiming to develop clinical treatment with exon skipping therapies for eligible patients with unique mutations. In 2022, she became a board member of the N of One Collaborative, a global umbrella organization aiming to facilitate development of antisense oligonucleotide therapy for patients with very rare eligible mutations. Dear Anemieke, you can start when you wish. Okay, thank you very much um, for this opportunity uh, to, to present here on, on genetic treatments. And I'll start with my disclosures. I will not read through them. So if you want to, to see all of them and read them, take a screenshot now. Um, because we need the time to go over the different genetic therapies. And what I will do, I will use Duchenne as an example. That's because well, I know most about Duchenne, but also because the different types of approaches are all in development for Duchenne. And then I will outline how some of those can also be used for, for limb girdles. Um, I will focus on the different types of genetic therapy. So adding genes, targeting gene transcripts and gene editing. Um, and I'll also explain the, the, the development states that, that they are in for Duchenne and, and, and other limb girdles. So before we go into Duchenne, for those of you who are less familiar, a brief introduction about um, what causes Duchenne, that is lack of dystrophin. And dystrophin acts as a shock absorber in skeletal muscles by connecting the skeleton of the muscle fiber, the actin, to the connective tissue surrounding the muscle fiber, so the extracellular matrix. You can see the functional domains, actin binding here and dystroglycan binding here connecting to the extracellular matrix are located at the beginning and the end of the protein. And that means that if there's a mutation that um, is out of frame, that disrupts the, 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 the genetic code, only the beginning of the protein is made and this linker function is lost. And this leads to Duchenne. However, when there's in-frame mutations that do not disrupt the code in the middle of the protein, then you get a protein that has the domain binding to the skeleton and that binds to the extracellular matrix. It's only slightly shorter. And these we find in Becker muscular dystrophy patients, um, which compared to Duchenne is a later onset and a slower progressive disease. Um, and we need this information because for Duchenne, most of the therapeutic approaches are based on the fact that shorter proteins are partially functional. Now, how does this work? So some brief explanation on genetics. So for um, uh, uh, genes contain the code for proteins, and these are located on exons. These exons, as you can see here, fit together like puzzle pieces, and then are linked together by the cell and then translated into protein. In most Duchenne patients, one or more exons are missing. You can see here 52 is missing. You can also see 51 doesn't fit to 53. And then we say the reading frame, the genetic code is disrupted. And when the cell translates this message, this DNA or RNA message into protein, it can do it until here, but then here the code is disrupted. It becomes unreadable. So protein translation stops. Here we have another deletion, so you can now see 51 and 52 are missing. So both, it's, it's a larger deletion, so two exons are missing instead of one. But you can also see 50 fits to 53. So here the reading frame is not disrupted and protein translation can continue from start to end. And this means that the dystrophin is partially functional, as I explained, this is what we find in Becker patients. Um, 
And it's important to bear in mind that this, for most proteins, this would not work. They will need all their domains. It's just that dystrophin has a lot of repeat domains in the center and therefore is a little bit is missing and the two crucial domains are located, uh, that are located at the beginning and end. If these are there, the protein will be partially functional. So what happens when there is no dystrophin? And of course, dystrophin associates with a lot of proteins, and, and some of these are, are, are uh, missing in, in uh, several of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. So when dystrophin or its associated proteins are not there, then the stabilization during muscle contraction is not happening. This means continuous muscle damage, chronic inflammation, and instead of muscle regeneration, the formation of scar tissue, so fibrosis and adiposis, and with that, loss of muscle tissue and loss of muscle function. And these processes, they happen in Duchenne, but they also happen in Becker, just at a slower rate, um, but they do happen. So when we try to develop therapies that, that, that want to, to um, restore the, the missing proteins in, in these diseases, there are some challenges. And again, this is not just for Duchenne, this is for all uh, muscular dystrophies. Muscle tissue is very abundant. So 30 to 40% of our body weight is skeletal muscle. And that means um, that you, you always will need a lot of therapy. Muscle is not a single organ. We have over 700 different muscles and almost all are affected in Duchenne and also in the girdle. Um, and this also means that if you do a team therapy, it's not enough to treat one muscle fiber in one skeletal muscle, that's not going to be therapeutic. You really need to reach a significant number of muscle fibers in a, all the different skeletal muscles in order to have a therapeutic effect. And then once muscle is lost, once it's replaced by fat and adipose tissue, this is often irreversible. So when a function is lost, this will not come back. So if your complete muscle has been replaced by fat and adipose tissue, you can bring back the gene that's missing, like the dystrophin gene for GGN, but then the ability of that fibrotic tissue to make dystrophin is not going to return it back into muscle. It will just stay fibrotic, and then that gene is not going to do anything. For motor neurons, things are easier. So for spinal muscular atrophy, um, you may be aware there is gene therapy, there's uh, um, oligonucleotide therapies. They're all quite effective, but that is because it's just easier to treat the motor neurons because there's much less of them and local treatment is also possible uh, for oligonucleotides. Today, the focus will be on skeletal muscles. So what can we do? How can we restore the missing protein? We can add genes and this we can do by cell therapy, gene addition therapy, targeting the transcripts, so emphasis oligonucleotides or ASOs, stop codon read-through, or targeting the DNA, and that's the gene editing. And I'll go over these uh, one by one, um, so that um, well, if at some point you lose your attention, when we go to the next one, you can start listening again. Mm -hmm. So we start with cell therapy. And cell therapy, people were thinking about cell therapy before we even knew which was the cause of Duchenne or limb girdles. We just saw that uh, people had muscle pathology. And the idea of cell therapy makes a lot of sense. You isolate muscle stem cells from a healthy individual, you expand them in the lab, and then you transplant them in the cell, in the patients. What they will do, they will repair the muscle damage, but because they're from a healthy individual, they can produce dystrophin or sarcoglycan or whatever protein is missing in a, in a limb girdle patient. And so they should have a double therapeutic effect, in theory. The reality, sadly, is that if you isolate muscle stem cells or stem cells from other parts of the body and you inject them into the bloodstream, they will not go to muscle. If you inject them into muscle, they will stay where they are. They will not migrate. So the efficiency is extremely low. And then the abundance of muscle is a problem because if you have one stem cell in a pathological muscle, that one stem cell is not going to counteract the pathology. That one stem cell is going to get the information from the pathological cells and will instead also become a fibrotic cell. So there's no evidence that stem cell treatment is effective or, 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 or safe. 
Um, and I think this is good because everyone, if you want stem cell treatment, you can get it somewhere, you can pay for it and, and, and travel to South America or to, to East Europe or to Asia, you can get stem cell treatment. But just bear in mind, there is no, uh, uh, no evidence that it works. And even though it sounds like it should work, um, there's challenges. And that is that we have a lot of muscle and these stem cells don't go to muscle very well. And there are also people that use stem cells to produce growth factors. Um, and these growth factors are then beneficial to, to muscles. Um, but that approach may work. It's also tested in clinical trials. But then you need to repeat the treatment every few months. So again, highlighting why these stem cells uh, are so inefficient. So if you get your stem cells from uh, the, the, the blood vessel walls, the bone marrow, fat, we know that these can go from the bloodstream into the muscle, but they do it very inefficiently. So say about one in 10,000 cells. So that means again, with the volume of the muscle, there will be a lot of pathological muscle and only very few of these stem cells that just are not enough to repair all the damage. So instead, they also become fibrosis. So I'll leave it there. I think you are aware that um, well, currently stem cell treatment is not uh, something that is close to clinical application in muscular dystrophies. So moving on to gene therapy or the gene addition therapy. So here the idea is patients cannot make a certain protein because they have uh, um, a mutated gene. What if we give a functional copy of that gene? Then with that, patients can make the protein. Um, and then what well, say problem uh, uh, should be solved. So how do we deliver these genes? Well, we can use viral vectors. Viruses can deliver genetic information to, um, to uh, tissues. Muscle is a difficult tissue to reach, but there is one virus that can do this, and it's called AAV, adeno-associated virus. And this means that you can only use it in people who have not seen AAV in the past. Normally, you don't get sick from AAV, so about 50% of adults have seen AAV at some point without getting sick. However, with gene therapy, you really need a lot of the viruses. So that means if you've seen it in the past and you have already an immune uh, response, giving the huge amount of viruses that you need for gene therapy is not safe uh, once you have already pre-existing immunity. Another challenge for um, Duchenne specifically is that AAV is small. So you can fit only small genes. And for lymph girdles, this is less of a problem because some of these genes are small and they do fit. For dystrophin, you really need to make it shorter because otherwise it don't, doesn't fit. And there's some other components. So you need to make sure that it only is expressed in skeletal muscle and heart sometimes. And also that there are some viral sequences so that the, the genes will go into the AAV particle. So I mentioned already AAV goes to muscle um, and there's different flavors of AAV. There's different serotypes and I think everyone knows now, like with the corona, you had the delta, you had the, the omicron, etc. AAV doesn't use Greek letters, it uses numbers, but there's different types, one, two, three, etc. And what you can see is skeletal muscle, what people mostly use is seven, four, so that's a derivative of this, eight and nine. And you see these can go to muscle and to heart, but they also go to liver. So they're, they're not specific for muscle. Um, they go to muscle, but they also primarily go to liver. So this is a consideration. So I mentioned already, the doses are very high. So if you've seen the virus before, you cannot be retreat, you cannot be treated with AAV because there will be a, a big immune response. Also, AAV normally is not pathogenic, but if you've not seen the virus before, um, and now you're treated for the first time with extremely high doses, those high doses are pathogenic. So seeing AV in the wild with a few viruses, that is not pathogenic, but treating with 10 to the 14th per kilogram um, viral vectors, that will lead to, to side effects. And this is again, because a lot of that will go to liver. Some of it will go to muscle, but a lot will go to liver and the liver has to cope with this. And of course, because you use these really high uh, amounts of viruses, there will be an immune response, both innate and adaptive. And this will also cause side effects. 
So I mentioned already patients who have pre-existing immunity are excluded from clinical trials and treatment because it's not safe, um, because they will get a massive immune response. Um, also patients who uh, are treated in a clinical trial and who don't have this pre-existing immunity, they get a high dose of steroids to reduce the immune response after the, the gene therapy treatment. So I mentioned that you need to express these, these, um, uh, uh, these genes specifically. And for Duchenne, this means muscle and heart because dystrophin has a function in muscle and heart. But for some limb girdle proteins, it's different. Um, because some of them are expressed in both the muscle and the heart, and then you want that. But for instance, calpain 3 should only be expressed in the skeletal muscle because in heart it is toxic. So when people start to develop these gene therapy factors, these are things that they need to consider. So where are we now? What is the current state of the art of gene therapy for Duchenne and the girdle? Well, for Duchenne, there's currently five different gene therapies that are in clinical development. And um, so they're in, in phase three trials or in phase two uh, or one, two trials. And one of them is approved for a selected group of patients in the US. And we'll, we'll go into that later. For limb girdle, there's also clinical trials ongoing. So there's an alpha and a beta sarcoglycan um, trial ongoing. And these are very early stages, but we know that with the gene therapy, there is the missing protein is restored. And for this furlin, um, this is a slightly, uh, this started slightly later, so I've not seen any results there. Um, but here, because the dysferlin gene is longer, the gene is split over to AAV and then has to be recombined when it's in, in a patient. Um, so we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Well, it works in mice, but we'll have to wait and see if it also works in humans. So these gene therapies, they're most advanced in Duchenne, but there's also now trials starting in, in limb girdle patients. So I mentioned already, AV is small and the dystrophin gene is large. So what is needed for Duchenne is a minimalist approach where you focus on the most crucial domains, the actin binding domain here and the cystin rich domain that binds to the extracellular matrix to connect the tissue. And then in the middle, you have some of these repeat domains. What you can see, there's four different types combined with different AV uh, numbers. Um, developed by the different companies. And you see they differ, but they are more similar than that they differ. Obviously, if you ask solid um, whether which one is best, they will say this one is best. If you ask the Sarepta Rose people, they will claim this one is best. We don't really know which one will be best, but we know they are more similar than they are different. So Current state of the art for these um, Duchenne microdystrophins is that there's one uh, of them approved. It's called now Elevidis, and it's approved in the US and in several countries in the Middle East. It's an accelerated approval, so approval is based just on the fact that if you treat patients with AAV and these microdystrophin genes, they start producing microdystrophin in the skeletal muscle. Confirmatory studies to see whether this leads to functional effects are still ongoing. It's only approved in young patients, four to five years old, and patients cannot have a deletion involving X on eight or nine, and we will get back to that. There's also a lot of clinical trials ongoing, uh, the confirmatory studies from Sarepta, um, but also trials from Solid and Pfizer and Regenic Bio and Geneton. And as, as I mentioned, the, they have different uh, types, so AP 9, 7, 4, and 8. And the one that's approved is the 7, 4, uh, AV microdystrophin. So far, over 500 patients have been treated, both with commercial treatment, now that the Sarepta elephantis is approved, and in clinical trials. And what we know from these findings is that if you treat patients with AAV microdystrophin, this will result in microdystrophin expression in skeletal muscle. The levels are dose dependent. So if you give a lower dose, you will get a few fibers that make a little bit of microdystrophin. If you give a higher dose, you will get a lot of the fibers that make higher dose uh, amounts of microdystrophin. The, there's also side effects and they can be severe to se very severe. And the risk of getting these severe side effects is related to the dose. However, you need 
you need a specific amount. You ideally you want the microscope to be expressed in the majority of fibers at high levels. And so you need a high dose, you cannot really go lower, that these high dose have risks of severe side effects. There's three patients, sadly, who have passed away so far. They all were treated with AAV9 microdystrophin. Um, and um, the, we, so two of them um, are, are were older patients, so 16 and 27-year-olds. So we thought it was age-related, but sadly, two weeks ago, a patient died who was only three years old. So it's age-related, um, but um, there's also a risk for younger patients. Um, to have these very severe side effects. So what do we know functionally? We know that there's microdystrophin produced, as I mentioned. Um, and from comparing Elevadis and Pfizer microdystrophin uh, compounds to natural history, the function of these patients seem to be better. However, part of the treatment with the, with the uh, gene therapy is very high dose corticosteroids, which we know also will slow down progression. So we really need the placebo-controlled trials to see whether there is any functional effect, whether there's a slower disease progression if you give these microdystrophin gene therapies. And um, so far, there is um, placebo-controlled data from two studies with elephantis. And um, the first study didn't see show a difference between treated and placebo. However, the treated patient had a suboptimal dose, so maybe. Um, I mentioned already, if you don't dose enough, there will be a lot less microdystrophin, and then we don't expect functional effects. So we can, can't really conclude from this that it doesn't work. Then there was a second study uh, where the primary endpoint was not met. So again, uh, the, the, the treated patient compared to placebo, the treated patient is slightly better, but it was not significantly better. And this was after 48 weeks of treatment. And the question is whether that is long enough. Um, I think we see more and more that you need long trials to show functional effects in, in, in the shed. There are additional phase three trials ongoing uh, from Pfizer and Sarepta and Roche, so we, we, we are waiting for, for these results to come in. So I mentioned the side effects already, um, and I don't want to, to trivialize this because there's severe nausea, there's liver damage, this can lead to hospitalization, and with AV9, there's also kidney failure, sepsis in some patients, and even death, sadly, in three patients. So these are acute. So if they don't happen within a few weeks after the treatment, then they, they don't start happening later. This is really acute due to the, the, the body responding to the AAV viruses at a high dose. There's also patients who develop a later side effects. And this is breakdown of skeletal muscle and myocarditis, so inflammation of the heart. And this has nothing to do with the AAV. This is an immune response to the microdystrophin that is expressed in muscle and heart. Um, and you can think, well, Duchenne patients don't make dystrophin, and now you give them dystrophin, the immune system will react to proteins that it doesn't know. The immune system of Duchenne patients shouldn't know microdystrophin. So shouldn't we see this autoimmune response in all patients? Well, you would expect that, but that's not what we see. We only see this in patients with large deletions at the beginning of the gene. Now, why is that? If we go back to our, our dystrophin protein. Um, we say Duchenne patients don't make dystrophin, but that's not really true. They don't make functional dystrophin in the muscle. Um, however, there's other isoforms. So for instance, there's an isoform in the brain that contains only this little bit, which is the end of the microdystrophin. So this part they know because there's a brain isoform that the immune system will have seen. Most patients have a mutation somewhere here in the middle. So they can make this part. It's not functional, it's not stable, but the immune system again will have been exposed to this. So now you have a microdystrophin with this bit and that bit and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. All these, these uh, these parts of the protein have been seen by the immune system. So these patients don't have an immune response to microdystrophin. Now, if we have patients who have a deletion in this area, and now you make a, a, a microdystrophin, which contains this area, the immune system will respond to that because they have not seen that before because patients with a deletion cannot make this. And now suddenly they start making it after the microdystrophin gene therapy, and then you get an autoimmune response. It's not seen in all patients, but in the patients where it is seen, it is very severe. And it, it, um, so far, um, uh, 
um, it, it seems that, 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 that uh, it, it, the, the, the clinicians can manage, but it's very severe and you end up with less muscle because there's active muscle breakdown and you may end up with, with permanent uh, uh, cardiac pathology. So it's making things worse rather than better. So for now, these patients are excluded from clinical trials and as you saw for the 11 treatment also from being treated. So this is why the patients with the deletion of exon 8 and 9 uh, or involving exon 8 or 9 cannot be treated with this. So what are the, the other challenges with, with the microdystrophin gene therapy? We know that it works in mice and dogs, but we don't know whether it works in humans. And humans walk on two legs, so dynamically uh, this is different. The placebo control trials are ongoing. What we do know is that microdystrophin is not fully functional. It's a smaller protein. We know in Becker there's muscle turnover. So with microdystrophin, there will be muscle turnover. And with muscle turnover, you will lose your transgene, you will lose your microdystrophin gene, and then with time, there will be less and less and less microdystrophin. And then the question is, at which point do you reach a level where it's no longer functional? And this question is, we, we don't know that. We don't know how long that will take. If it takes 100 years, it's not so much of a problem. If it takes two years, it's a bigger problem. There will be an immune response to AAV. So that means if you've seen AAV before, you are excluded from, from the trials or the treatment. And once you've been treated, you cannot retreat. And for a few patients, there's uh, an immune response to the microdystrophin, as I explained. So we're going to move to the transcript targeting treatment. Um, so and starting with antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs or AOMs. So what are these? These are small pieces of modified RNA or, uh, or, or DNA that are synthesized. And they can target the RNA transcript. So you have the, the gene and then you get the RNA transcripts. Um, AONs can target these and they can either decrease the amount of toxic protein that is produced or restore a missing protein. Um, and they're unique because they do Watson Crick base pairing. So they're very specific and have very targeted effects. Um, so this means you can intervene at the genetic level uh, and, and, and have a therapeutic effect. So because DNA and RNA are very poor drugs, because they're unstable, we need chemical modification to improve the stability. Um, also, they're poor drugs because they're small. So you will uh, uh, get them into the urine very quickly because the kidney will just filter them out. So uh, some of the AONs have a phosphorylated backbone, which will prevent renal clearance. And there's many modifications possible, um, and it will depend on, on the therapeutic approach based on you choose. So I mentioned you can use them for knockdown, but for uh, Duchenne, they're mainly used, or they're only used to restore the missing protein by modulating the splicing. Well, how does that work? We're here back with our example of a Duchenne mutation. So we have a deletion of exon 48 to 50 here, and we have a gene, and then there's a transcript, the RNA transcript that contains the exons, but also the bits in between, the introns. And during splicing, the cell will connect all the exons, then you get your messenger RNA, which is translated into protein. What we see, 47 doesn't fit to 51, but 47 would fit to 52. So what we want when the cell links all these exons together, we want the cell to miss this one, to skip it. How can we do that? We can do this with AON. So they bind specifically to exon 51 in this case. Now the exon is skipped, the reading frame is restored, and the Duchenne patient can make a better like protein. So this is the theory. So what is the current state of the art? There's four AONs approved in the US, Japan, Israel, again, certain Middle Eastern countries, um, and these four AONs start at exon 51, 53, and 45. So this is four, these are only three exons, that is because 53 has two AONs approved. And this is a mutation-specific approach. So depending on where the mutation are and how long it is, you need to skip a specific exon. So it's not applicable to everyone, and these three exons together would uh, apply to about 30% of patients. Like the microdystrophin, approval is only based on dystrophin restoration, and the levels are very low or low, so uh, less than 1% to 1%, and in one case about 5%. And what we don't know yet is whether there will be functional effects of the treatments. Um, 
And yesterday, um, the result of one of these trials came in. So the 53 uh, compound filter Larsen, there was a 48 week treatment compared to placebo and the results came in and they did not meet their primary endpoint. So the time to stand com placebo compared to treatment was, there was no significant difference. And again, as I said before, 48 weeks may be too short. And sadly, this was the one that induced 5% of dystrophin. Um, but well, at the end of, of 48 weeks, they couldn't see a functional effect. Further uh, analysis is ongoing. So this is very new news. Uh, we don't know the results of that. So we'll have to wait and see. But for now, this is, of course, uh, uh, not what we were hoping for. What is clear? that regardless of whether one or 5% of dystrophin will slow down disease progression, more dystrophin should have a larger effect on disease progression. So there's room for improvement. And what people are working on is trying to improve the delivery to skeletal muscle and heart. So how can you do that? You can uh, do this targeted by uh, using antibodies to the transferrin receptor. Transferrin receptor is highly expressed on skeletal muscle. So if you have an antibody to that, and you link your AON to that, the AON will specifically go to muscle. Um, so that's in clinical development. But you can also add short peptides um, with arginines, and that will lead to up increased uptake everywhere. So not just in muscle, but everywhere. But if you have everywhere increased uptake, you will also have it in skeletal muscle and heart. And I mentioned already, applicability is an issue. So each AON only applies to a subset of patients, which makes clinical development challenging. So here, what we see is the different axons and how many of the, the mutations uh, skipping this axon would apply to. And then we see there's approved treatments, but all of them also have ongoing confirmatory studies. And you also see that there's other studies. So this is, Dyne is doing transferrin receptor antibody affinity as well. Then we have um, uh, PepGen and Entrana and Sarepta doing these, um, these peptides, these small peptides to improve uptake in general. There's new types of chemical modifications by Biomarin and, and, and Wave. So all of these are in um, clinical trials. And what you can see, well, People say, well, we're not going to go for exon 50 because that's only 4% of patients. That's a really very small number of patients. But you can see there's currently three clinical trials ongoing for exon 53 skipping. Well, that's 8% of patients divided by three, which is a very small group. So I think you can see that this is a challenge because it's a very uh, a lot of, of different companies trying to, to develop this for the same exons. So then we're moving to stop going on retro. Let me check the time. So stop code on read-through, again, is also a mutation-specific approach that acts at the transcript level. It only works for nonsense mutations. So we have here, again, our favorite transcript, the dystrophin transcript, exon 1 to 79. And for the cell, there is a start signal that tells the, the translation machinery, this is where you need to start translating. And then at the end, there's a stop. Protein is ready. Now, nonsense mutations are mutations where the code for one amino acid is changed into a code for a stop, as you can see here. So now this one is used and only the beginning of the protein is made and therefore it's not functional. The rest of the genetic code is intact. If you have a deletion or an insertion or a duplication, then you get a frame shift. And if you get a frame shift, you get the wrong amino acids and also a lot of these stops. Stop code or read through can suppress these, these premature stops. So if you use it for, for this mutation, what you get is from start to end. If you would use it for these mutations, well, maybe you would be able to suppress some of these stops. But the problem is you would still include the wrong amino acid. So this protein is not going to be functional regardless. So this only works for patients with these nonsense mutations, which for Duchenne is about 10%. So what is the current state of the art here? Um, the stop code or read compound is called Atalurin. And this received conditional approval from the EU in ambulant patients currently two years and older. So conditional approval means that every year um, the EMA checks, is it still safe? And is there any data to suggest that it's not working? If there's data that suggests that it works, they will get full approval. But if it's not working, it should be off the market. 
it's marketed in several European countries, in several Middle Eastern countries, and in several South American countries. And as I said, it's only for non such mutations. So because it was conditionally proved, the company PTC had to do confirmatory study. And certainly the first confirmatory study didn't show that the compound worked. It also didn't show that the compound didn't work. So then EMA said, well, we can't take it off the market with this data, um, but we're also cannot fully approve it. You will need to do a second confirmatory studies, a study. And the results of this are in. So that was a one and a half year treatment, uh, placebo compared to treatment. And the treated patient walked 14 meters more in six minutes. This was a significant difference. However, the question is, is it clinically relevant? In addition to these confirmatory study, um, also data was collected in patients who were using the drug commercially because it was approved in 2014. So there's been data accumulating from patients who use this commercially. And if you compare these patients to natural history of patients who were not treated, then you see that the loss of ambulations seems to be delayed by three years. But the question is, of course, can you really compare the treated patients to the natural history because the treated patients have one type of mutation, the non such mutation, while the natural history will have all sorts of, of, of mutations. And of course, the natural history, there may be other uh, 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 differences. The company, so PTC says, well, we have found a way that we can really match the patients who are treated with ethylurin and we, we, we find their best match in the natural history data and we compare these. So this is a fair comparison. However, EMA said, well, we will just look at the clinical trial data. And based on that, they said, we cannot approve this. And also we cannot extend the conditional approval. Um, now, in a strange reversal of fortunes, normally EMA gives an advice and the European Commission has to formalize the advice. But the European Commission did not do this because there were some procedural um, um, mistakes in the evaluation of ethylurin and also some other drugs. So these evaluations have to be redone. So for now, ethylurin is still available in the EU and we'll have to wait and see what this re-evaluation brings. Um, I don't know whether um, PTC has already applied for FDA approval with, for ethylurin. Um, so I don't know the... the uh, what, what the plan is there. Um, in, in Europe, it's still on the market. In, in uh, the US, it's not on the market yet. So can we use this also for other diseases, like kernel diseases? Um, in theory, yes, because if it's a non sense mutation, then yes, so for the subset of, 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 of patients who have a non sense mutation, it could work. Um, but it may not work for everything because the non-sense mutations sometimes lead to um, uh, very unstable transcripts and then the drug would not be able to do its work. So therefore you would first need to show in preclinical models whether or not this would be the case. So um, for now, it's only approved for use to share in Europe. So then we're gonna to move to the final piece genome editing, um, and I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, what is it? It's a scissor that cuts the DNA and a GPS that tells the scissor where to cut. Now, why would you want to cut the DNA? You do this because you want to activate the repair mechanism. And in the binding cells, this, you can use this to, to make um, uh, repairs, errorless repairs. However, Skeletal muscle is not dividing. So we are stuck with the glue system where you have a double-stranded uh, break. So you cut the DNA and then these two pieces are just put back together. And this will cause small mutations, but the cell thing, well, at least we have most of our DNA still there. Um, so you cannot really do this to correct mistakes or to add what is missing in the lesions. But you can do it to induce permanent axon skipping. Or if you have a disease that is caused by production of a toxic protein, well, then making a mistake so that that protein is no longer produced would be uh, useful. Here, because we already have explained axon skipping, we'll use that example again. But we have again here the deletion of 52. 51 doesn't fit to 53, but 50 would fit to 53. Now, if we have an AON, so I mentioned there's an AON approved for 51 skipping. What I didn't mention is that that AON needs to be re 
uh, delivered intravenously every week with an infusion of a few hours. That is a high burden. And that's needed because well, the RNA doesn't have the eternal life, the protein doesn't have the eternal life, the AOM doesn't have the eternal life, so there's turnover. So you need to repeat the treatment. However, if you could make axon 51 invisible on DNA level, then every time an RNA is made, it would be uh, with a restored reading frame. So you would have to do this only once. However, this is of course the situation in one of the skeletal muscle nucleus, um, nuclei, that's not enough. You again need to do this in a majority of muscle fibers, in a majority of muscles, otherwise there will not be an effect. So there's a lot of opportunities for gene editing and researchers are really excited. And that is because there's a lot of things that we can now do that used to be impossible. So some model systems, it took us years and now we can make them in weeks. So of course, if that is that easy, people start thinking about therapy. There's a Nobel Prize that was given for the, the, the gene editing approach, but it was given for chemistry, not medicine. And there's also a lot of examples that in cultured cells, in animal models, gene editing works. It can restore dystrophin. There's a clinical trial for liver disease. So then I think if you have a muscle disease, you'll think, well, if you can do it for liver, can't you then also do it for muscle? Um, and there's even a gene editing of drug approved now for blood disease. If you can do it for blood disease, can't you also do it for, um, for uh, muscles? But there is a but, and that is for the blood disease, they take the blood stem cells outside of, of the body, they do the gene editing, and then they check for quality, and then they transplant the cells back. And that works with the blood disease, but stem cell treatment doesn't work for Duchenne and other muscular dystrophies we know already. Um, for the liver disease, well, the liver is just much easier to target than the muscle. So what do we need to solve for, for muscle diseases? First, um, the efficiency to, to deliver to muscle is low. Another thing is that if you work on dystrophin, you will not, people will say, often say, we corrected the mutation. Well, not really. You allow a Duchenne patient to make a better dystrophin, which is a step forward but it's not a full and normal dystrophin. So you don't expect that this will be a cure. And the time of intervention will, will matter. That's the case for all the therapies I discussed, but when people use the phrase CRISPR cure, of course, people will have unrealistic expectations and think that even if they're in a wheelchair, that the CRISPR can, can undo that. Sadly, that is not the case. There's also some safety aspects. Um, how specific is the, uh, the GAS9, the scissor? Can it also cut somewhere else? Um, and well, then it's permanent. There's no undo button. Um, but there's also the, the risk of immunity to GAS9. It's a protein that's produced by bacteria. So if you have tissues that start to express this protein continuously, like with the microdystrophin, if the body doesn't, uh, this GAS9 shouldn't be there, the body might start to attack the tissues that produce the Cas9. And then again, you get a worse situation than you started out with. You start to break down your muscle and your heart. Uh, so I mentioned this already, the, it, it, the expected treatment depends on the time of intervention, but also the number of muscle and fibers that are successfully edited. And you will not produce normal uh, dystrophin. So what does, do we need to improve the delivery? For now, people are using AEV, which works for microdystrophin, but the challenge is, um, so why are people using this for liver? Because with liver, they can give a lipid nanoparticle with uh, a messenger RNA for Cas9, for the scissor protein. So you get very short expression, and this whole immune, system, immune response to the Cas protein is less of a worry because it's there for a few days. And also this problem of maybe it will start doing the wrong edits is less of a problem because it's only there for a few days. For muscle, these nanoparticles don't work. So you need AAV and then all of this is a problem. So these are things that we really need to improve as a field. Um, so in summary, which perfectly on time, um, gene therapy can restore dystrophin expression and also other missing proteins um, as shown in some of the Libertal trials. 
it requires viral vectors and they're currently delivered to high doses. Side effects can occur. It's so far not for patients with pre-existing immunity. And there's, this is a new field, so there's lots of unknown and uncertainty. And gene editing is still in preclinical uh, stage for uh, muscle disease. I see that I didn't include the, the, the stop codon read-through and the axon skipping here, um, but also there. Um, there's a lot of unknown, and we, we really need to first show whether there's a slow, slower disease progression for these. So with that, I will thank you and stop sharing so I can also see you. And I'm, of course, happy to answer questions that you may have. You're on mute. Yeah. Thank you for this clear, complete, and updated uh, webinar on genetic therapies in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And now, um, if you have, have questions, you can write it in on the Q&A, uh, or you can raise your hand and you can answer the question. Meantime, I have one question. <laughs> um, uh, it, my question is about the multi-axon skipping because there are patients that would benefit from the skipping of more than one axon. How is uh, this? Yeah. So I think with, with AOMs, uh, multi-axon skipping for now is not being considered. Um, and that's for several reasons. One is that you need very high doses. Um, so if axon skipping would be close to 100% efficient, it would not be a problem. You can just combine one and two, and then you will get a lot of, of, of skipping both axons. But you see now that the, the dystrophy and restoration levels are in the order of 1%. So now if we start combining them, what, what you need, you need one nucleus where both the AONs are there. And the efficiency of delivery is so, so limited, that you will get 1% of 1% that have both AONs. And well, then you get really minute levels of, of dystrophin. So um, maybe this is something to explore when uh, the newer approaches reach higher levels of dystrophin. Um, but for now, it's not considered. And of course, if you need to combine, it also needs to be tolerable because you need to double the dose. And if that leads to side effects, then of course, you, you cannot do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do you have questions? We have a question uh, on the Q&A box. Yes, the question is, thank you for this comprehensive overview of the therapeutic approaches for DMD. Do you have information of long-term safety and efficacy for the different a ASO on the market for DMD? So I think for efficacy, we still don't have any confirmatory data. Um, we can compare patients treated commercially with natural history, and that has been done, and that suggests efficacy. But the question is, how valid is this comparison? And I think well, that, that, that's an argument we can have, at least for the regulatory agencies, this is not a valid comparison that they appreciate. Um, so for efficacy, the trials are still out there. Sadly, for the filter Larsen, um, well, uh, at least in one year, they couldn't show efficacy. Um, but maybe if they had done longer trials. So um, Ethoplersen, Golodersen, and Casimersen are being tested in placebo-controlled trials that are longer, I think two years and three years. And these results will, will, will come in, I think, next year. So we'll, we don't know. For the safety, um, these compounds are tolerated really well. And that's also what you expect um, because these compounds, I mentioned you can give the AONs a phosphatidylate backbone and that will prevent renal clearance, but that will also drive toxicity. But these AONs, the four that are approved in, in the US, they don't have a phosphatidylate backbone. So what that, does that mean? That means that 90% will very quickly be in the urine uh, but it also means that they're relatively inert. So they go to the, to the muscle, they will do their thing there, but the rest of the body doesn't really seem to, to, to have an issue with them. Um, and there have been uh, patients treated for, um, for over 10 years um, 
without apparent uh, long-term side effects. So they're quite well tolerated. I think most of the side effects that are described are because it's intravenous infusion. So patients need a port um, and um, that's, well, that, that can lead to um, infections and things like that. But the, 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 the PMOs, the, so the, the chemistry of the approved ASO, that seems to be tolerated very well by patients, even with weekly high-dose infusion. Okay, we have more questions. One is related to calpine 3. Uh, the question is from Corrado Angelini. Can calpine 3 be, be directed to muscle and not heart? Yeah, so this is a challenge. So the AAV will often go to both skeletal muscle and the heart. Um, so, and even if it primarily go to muscle, if a little bit goes to heart and then it does harm there, that's not what you want. So what instead they do, um, they will, you can uh, add a promoter, so the volume switch. So what you need, you need the volume switch that only is on a skeletal muscle and not in heart. So then even if the AV goes to the heart and it's there, there will not be calpain 3 produced because the volume switch just says, well, this gene should not be on in the heart. So that's the way they, they try to, to solve that problem. Okay. There is a question, well, a comment from Rosario Santos. Thank you for this excellent overview. And a question from the same person. What approaches are being worked on for DMD duplications? Um, so actually there has been one very small exon skipping trial uh, for duplications of patients with the duplication of one exon. Um, and that's been done by Kevin Flanagan in the US. And um, because, so the, the challenge with, with duplications, if they're large, is that you need to skip one of the duplicated exons. So you say you have a duplication of 51 to 56. You want to skip the second exon 51, but not the first. However, they are identical. So you will dilute your effect because sometimes you will skip the one that you want to target, but sometimes you will skip the one that you don't want to target. So for larger duplications, it's not possible. For duplications of one exon, if we do this in cultured cells, what we get, we skip both exons and then you have a deletion and you are still out of frame. However, because the delivery is so inefficient, now we have a benefit because the chance that two AONs will be in the same cell is very little. So there will just be one AON and whether it targets the first exon or the second exon for single exon duplications doesn't matter because the result will be a normal transcript afterwards. And so that's been tested. And indeed, this leads to, to dystrophin restoration. And for larger duplications, um, people are looking into gene editing, where you could just cut out the extra thing, um, which works in cultured cells. But then, of course, the challenge is, how do we now move this into patients? Because, well, that's, uh, that, that's all the challenges that, I, that went over. But in theory, and in, in, in model systems, and the gene editing approach works. And there is a question from Agnes Di Martino. It's possible to use gene editing to skip triplets, for example, for BM1. Um, so that's also something people are working on. Um, so they try to use a gene editing to really cut out just a bit of these, these, these triplets. Um, so in, in theory, yes. Um, again, you are then you have the problem. How do you deliver it to, to all the cells? Um, but yeah, this principle is being investigated. And for DM1, what people are also using, they're also using um, uh, AONs because with AONs you can reduce the amount of toxic proteins. We didn't discuss that here. That's a different type of approach. But you can reduce toxic uh, transcripts. And of course, with for DM1, uh, then you can target this. Um, this triplet expanded transcript. Um, so that's that's also um, in, in, in clinical development at the moment. We have a question from Katarinka Kupidura Polik. With regard to antisense oligonucleotides, do you believe the targeting strategy selected for clinical development with anti uh, transferring receptor antibodies is indeed superior? to, for example, cholesterol conjugates or other previously researched antisense oligonucleotides? 
Is there a way to test the oligonucleotide antibody conjugates in an academic lab? Do you know of a way to have these anti-center oligonucleotides manufactured? Yeah, so I think, so, um, so based on the, 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 the preclinical data that I've seen, these transferrin antibody conjugate work, work really well and they work better than anything I've seen in mouse. So that, how does that translate to human? We'll have to wait and see. Um, and of course, one other challenge is um, what, what we would really like as academics is, okay, so we have now this small peptide, this arginine-enriched peptide, we have the transferrin receptor, and we have our own thing. How do they compare? But of course, the companies are not going to say, well, I, if you call them and say, well, I want to compare your compound, Sarepta, I want to compare your compound to the Dicom, they don't want that. Um, so this is the thing, you cannot get them from the company. Um, there are uh, companies that can make certain of these things that they can make you. So like Excel Lab is a, a, a German company that can really make a lot of different things. Uh, oligonucleotide, different chemistries, conjugates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They, so they they might be able to make this for you, but it's quite expensive. Um, so then I think just to have your scientific curiosity <laughs> to, to have that uh, addressed, um, often well at least we we were unable to to do this. Um, but I think so. What I I really hope that the transferrin antibody. AONs work as well in humans as they work in mice. Because if that's the case, then I think we, we, we finally are able to, to reach the muscle. Yeah, and one advantage also is the frequency of administration. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. So I think that's, that, yeah, that's one thing I didn't put on my slides, but definitely the newer approaches, um, they treat once every month or even two months or six weeks, which is much better than every week, yes. Okay, and there's another question again from Agnes Di Martino. Uh, so it's possible, according to you, combine these two approach for one or is too aggressive? Um, so I think again, in theory, yes, you can do this in a mouse, in a cell model. Yes, you can, you can try this and see whether there's an additive effect. I think in a clinical trial, you would always have to test one and then um, maybe once they're both independently approved, you can you can discuss whether there would be options to do both. Um, but uh, you can't start that way in patients. In animal models, in cell models, of course, you, you, you can do a lot more. And um, this may be interesting because what's happening now for Lucien is, of course, some patients have been treated with gene therapy um, and now also want exon skipping because they have a mutation that's eligible to exon skipping. So they want a gene therapy trial uh, treatment and exon skipping. And some patients who've been treated with the exon skipping drugs that are approved in the US now also want gene therapy. So they, they're, they don't have the gene editing, but they're trying to combine uh, the, the two approaches. And of course, we know already from the SMA field that there's also patients who use both Solgensma and Lucinersen. Um, so even if you think it's too aggressive, once they are both approved, most likely patients will start doing this uh, themselves. Okay. Uh, there are no more questions. Um, I think we can finish here the, the webinar. Thank you again for Thank sharing you. your knowledge with all of us. <laughs> And if people come up with questions, they can always email me and I'll just answer them. Because I know usually one hour post meeting, you will think of a question. <laughs> so feel free to email me in that case. Thank you very much, Anne-Emile. Thank you, Francina. And see you maybe on another webinar. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.